Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as we've talked about, um, this is Ron Schneider. He has, um, I met Ron, and now you all have seen Ron and the Dream Finders. We watched that the last two weeks. And so my first experience, I told you all, um, or the reason I reached out to Ron is um, Figment was one of my favorite characters, possibly favorite character at, uh, within Disney. And so when I found out he was the original Dreamfinder, um, although I found out, um, I have pictures, but they're, they were not when you were the original, right. you were the Dreamfinder. Um, but I wanted to reach out and see if he would be gracious enough to talk in class. And so he has, and he's done, uh, you've seen he's done a lot of other things. He's worked at Disneyland. Um, he was also part of the opening cast of uh, Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor. So he's going to talk to us today about some of the things that he's done, some of the history um, that he studied of the company, and then we'll have time for question and answer at the end. All right? So take it away, Ron. Thank you. Well, Cody's given me quite a list of topics that he wanted me to touch on uh, about Walt Disney, about the origins of Disneyland, uh, but most especially my hobby, which uh, from being a teenager was uh, Disneyland, its history and how it worked. And so I'm going to try and cover 40 years and 40 minutes and leave us some time for uh, questions. Um, starts back in 1952. I was born in Southern California. My father worked for the family company, which did air conditioning. And he got a call to do air conditioning for Walt Disney's new project going up in Anaheim. So we had passes to the first day that Disneyland was open, uh, July 18, 1955. The uh, only memories we have of that day, my mother remembers looking around and saying to my father, gosh, this is nice. It's a shame in a year it'll be all run down and dirty. Uh, we had lunch in a saloon in Frontierland, sitting in the back of the room. Uh, they uh, brought me a sandwich, and because I was uh, two and a half years old, I was all focused on my food. I paid no attention to the uh, loud, brightly lit thing going on on the other end of the room. Twenty-five years later to the day, I was the loud, brightly lit thing going on at the other end of the room. And the story of how I got from the back of the theater to the stage is the beginning of the story I'm going to tell you today. Now, if you grew up in America back in the 50s and 60s, there was a thing that happened called uh, kid show hosts. These were live television shows that happened in the afternoon after you got home from school. They had live hosts. Generally, these were newscasters and weathermen who had nothing to do during the day, so they put a funny <coughs> hat on. They gave them a nickname. We had Engineer Bill, Sheriff John, Skipper Frank. They would show cartoons, and they'd have puppets, and they did ventriloquism, and they did magic. And I think this is where I got bit with the performing bug quite young. I started doing um, shows as soon as I could get into the community theater. And um, this is uh, where I got my fascination with that. My, as I grew older, my mother turned me on to musicals. And in 1963, she took me into Beverly Hills. We grew up in, uh, I was exactly halfway between 20th Century Fox and MGM. And uh, we would go into Beverly Hills and we saw in 1963, the movie The Music Man with Robert Preston, and I saw this traveling salesman character, very fast talking, skipping around town, mesmerizing all the people. I love this kind of guy, any fast talking kind of guy. Danny Kaye, uh, W.C. Fields, all these crooked characters, I love them, and um, I learned all those songs, I learned all their patter bits, and this is something that uh, kind of stuck with me throughout my life. Uh, in uh, my hobbies, I went through three phases of hobbies in the 60s. First of all, the Beatles. The walls of my bedroom were covered with posters of the Beatles. Then in 1966, Batman, the television series with Adam West, was all over my bedroom walls. And then in 1966, on December 15th, Walt Disney died. And it struck me what a tremendous influence he'd had on my life. I'd grown up going to Disneyland and was always fascinated with it. But this time, when I went to the park, I started looking around and thinking about Disneyland in, as a form of theater. I realized that this was a giant stage and the guests were the stars of the show. I decided later on, uh, Marshall McLuhan said that the medium is the message. Well, at Disneyland, the audience is the medium. What we create in theme parks, uh, our product is not the architecture and it's not the rides, it's not the music, it's not the food. It's your experience of those things, your emotional, intellectual, and uh, physical experience 
of Main Street. That's what we're, we're, we're what we are creating there. And um, this fascinated me. Now, uh, I started studying uh, Disneyland. Now, this is back in the 60s. No internet. There were no books to speak of about Disneyland. Nobody was doing any kind of serious uh, uh, study of it. Uh, there was one book came out about Walt Disney's life by Bob Thomas called Walt Disney Magician of the Movies. This is, but it was the company Whitewash. It was all true, but it was just all the goody-goody stuff. And um, so I had to find out more about Disneyland and the man behind it. Come on in, have a seat. Here's what you missed so far. Um, so I went down to the Los Angeles Library and I started looking for books on Disneyland. Couldn't find any a note. But I did find out that they had a microfilm uh, section and they had all the back issues of the Los Angeles Times. I spent the entire day. Uh, printing out pages of old articles from the Los Angeles Times on the history of Disneyland. And I started putting together notebooks uh, of, of things I could find. There were some magazines that Disney put out every so often that uh, would occasionally have an intelligent article about the park, but mostly just the fluff pieces. Um, in the 60s, Disneyland was undergoing a tremendous uh, revolution because of the New York World's Fair. In 1964 and 65, Walt Disney did four shows at the New York World's Fair. He did the Ford Magic Skyway, he did the Carousel of Progress, Great Moments of Mr. Lincoln, It's a Small World, and um, this, uh, these shows helped fund all this new technology. And so at Disneyland in the 60s, we got the Enchanted Tiki Room, we got Pirates of the Caribbean and the Haunted Mansion, we got the whole new Tomorrowland and the Carousel of Progress and It's a Small World. And this is a whole new form of storytelling, which fascinated me. I was all caught up in this, uh, in this, the excitement about this. But the thing that struck me, because my field, my interest was live performance, I became more interested in what could be done with this new atmosphere in the realm of live performance. But Disney wasn't doing much with those shows. Uh, all they had was uh, the fiberglass character heads. So you took a vital, exciting, wonderful character like Mickey Mouse and now he was uh, no longer vital and exciting. He was a big fiberglass head with a smile nailed to it, and he was just good for still photographs. And the character shows that they were doing were all pre-recorded and, and had no particular plot. And I thought to myself, there's more we can do here. I mean, I had already done a number of shows in high school and college, and, and there was more I wanted to do with this form. I realized that there was a revolution coming, just as there had been with the technological arm of things. I said, I, I sensed that there was going to be someday a revolution in live entertainment in, in theme parks. And so I decided that this was going to be my field of study. I read one time in a Disney training manual, somebody wrote, nobody trains their kids to work at Disneyland and there's no college that teaches how to work in a theme park. Well, when I read that, I decided that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to study that. I want to become and as much knowledgeable about that as possible, and maybe someday I'm going to write a book about it. Uh, so I studied uh, the history of Disneyland. Now, Disneyland grew up uh, out of, uh, there's a, the legend is that um, uh, Walt was sitting on a park bench watching his daughters on the carousel at uh, Griffith Park, and he thought to himself, wouldn't it be great if there was a place where adults and children could enjoy themselves together instead of just the adults sitting back and watching the kids? But, uh, the truth is that Disneyland was born, uh, inspired by many different ideas. Walt Disney, when he was a child, he had an uncle who worked on the Santa Fe Railroad. So he was always fascinated with trains. Uh, when he was, had the studio in uh, Burbank in uh, 1939, they used to get letters from people all over the country saying, I'm coming out to California, I'd like to come over and see how the cartoons are made. Well, Walt couldn't bring them into the studio, it would disrupt everything. So he was aware that there needed to be something that people could visit, that, uh, that there was a desire for that out there. He um, had two people who worked for him as animators who were train nuts like he was. And they had trains in their backyard. They had little miniature trains that you could ride around. You could sit on them and ride. Walt uh, built one for his own home. Um, they went out to the uh, Ward Kimball, and Walt went out to the Chicago Railroad Fair in uh, 1949 and saw all these trains. And Walt got up on stage and rode these trains across the stage uh, if you look up Chicago Railroad Fair, you'll see video of this. Um, they visited the Ford Museum 
in Chicago. When Walt was traveling in Europe, he visited a park called Tivoli in Copenhagen. It's a little park right in the middle of the city that had amusement park rides. At the time Walt saw it, it had been open for 50 years. It's now been open for about uh, over 100 years. And it's still the same clean, spotless, magical place. And these are all influences on the creation of Disneyland. Disneyland started out as a rather small plant. It was going to be built on a lot next to the studio in, uh, out in Burbank. And it was, was going to be about the same size as, uh, it's, uh, uh, as Main Street is now. But it kept getting bigger. Walt kept adding ideas to it. He kept putting in uh, franchises from the television show that he hosted. So we got uh, Davy Crockett's Arcade, and we got the, the Jungle Cruise from the Nature's Wonderland shows. And um, so it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, when Walt uh, died, and I started getting serious about studying Disneyland. So I would go to the park. I started buying postcards. I started by collecting postcards. And I would take with me my little Instamatic camera, and I'd take like 10 rolls of black and white film, and I'd shoot pictures of everything. I brought my cassette recorder with me, and I recorded all the ride narrations. I knew every ride narration by heart in all of Disneyland. I used to get up at parties and perform great moments with Mr. Lincoln for people. Um, I had uh, I shot a Super 8 millimeter film of everything, and just was take this home and studied it and looked at it. Um, and uh, this all inspired me. Uh, one more thing happened. I got to visit the Disney archives, which opened in 1970. I read an article in Variety magazine <clears throat> that uh, they were just starting these archives. I wrote to Dave Smith, who was running the archives. He invited me in, and I was kind of one of the first people to get to, get to visit the Disney archives in Burbank. And I got to see the original Lincoln robot. I got to see the cells, the animation cells from the first Mickey Mouse cartoon. I got to handle those. I got to go into Walt's formal office, which hadn't been touched, just had been dusted in the four years since his passing. I got to use Walt's bathroom, as a matter of fact. Um, so I felt touched by all of this. In 1970, I was at Disneyland with a bunch of my high school buddies, and I saw, for the first time, the Golden Horseshoe Review. This was uh, this Wild West show in the saloon. And there was a guy in the show named Wally Bogue. He was a comic. He'd been hired personally by Walt Disney in 1955. At the time I saw the show in 1970, Wally had been doing the show for 15 years, five shows a day. And it was like vaudeville. I'd always felt I had missed my time. I should have been born in the time of vaudeville. And here was a guy who was living it up. And he was hysterically funny, and everybody was cheering and laughing. And I took one look at Wally Bogue, and I said, that's what I want to do with my life. I want to be Wally Bogue. I want to be in this show. And so I studied it. I filmed it, I taped it, I memorized the whole thing. And I had this fantasy that one day I'd show up at the show and somebody would come out and say, well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately our, our comedian has been taken ill and is there anyone in the audience who knows the role and can step in and, and, and fill in for Wally Bogue? And I thought, you know, I'd jump up. Well, this is 1970. And I decided that I was going to do everything I could to work towards that goal. And this is the way a hobby becomes an occupation, is by pursuing your bliss. I uh, stopped taking regular jobs. I had worked uh, you know, processing damaged luggage and cutting reupholstery fabric for cars, but I decided I wasn't gonna take any more real jobs. I was going to, if I was gonna have a job, I would have to wear a costume and a name tag. 1970, a new amusement park opened up north of uh, Los Angeles called Magic Mountain. And I got a job as a ride operator. And uh, they had a microphone in our queue lines at the rides. So I would glom onto these microphones and I would talk to the people standing in the queue lines. And eventually I wrote uh, crowd control spiels for all the major rides at Magic Mountain. And everybody around the mountain was doing the material I created. I started by stealing material from Wally Bogue and the Jungle Cruise and all the stuff from Disneyland, but eventually I created my own stuff. And that was my first theme park job. The second summer, Magic Mountain was open. They opened a children's animal farm. And so I became the old man of the mountain, wore a buckskin outfit, worked with wild animals. I had a full grown African lion uh, that I used to sit with and tell stories to kids. And uh, we had a whole big petting zoo there. I worked with snakes and cockatoos, and um, it was, that was a real experience. Uh, then there's a themed dinner show over in Los Angeles called 1520 AD, the medieval restaurant. <clears throat> it's a dinner show built around uh, the idea of uh, a surprise birthday party for King Henry VIII. So I was King Henry VIII in Los Angeles. We had uh, the show was so successful 
that we had three theaters in Los Angeles, all in the same building, running the same show, selling out two shows per room all night long. I opened the one in California, in, in Los Angeles, uh, moved down to San Diego, and I ran down the show down there for, for a year. I fell in love with theme dinner shows. Uh, it's the, I call it the long form because you've got your audience seated for two hours, and they're being fed, and you're giving them booze, and you can tell a real story. You can give them a role in the story being told. And uh, the actors get to sleep in, and you go to the theater about 4 o'clock, you do two shows, and you're home by 11. Um, but I just love that, that atmosphere, the theme dinner show. Uh, in uh, 1973, I wound up going to college, went to Los Angeles City College Theater Academy, had a wonderful department. They would do show after show after show after show, and I got a whole bunch of experience in various forms of performing. But I always had it in the back of my mind, the stuff I was learning for was I wanted to be Wally Bogue. I wanted to work in the theme parks. I wanted to, I wanted to do shows where it was me and you, the audience member. I do a two-person act, and the other person doesn't know their lines. My job is to engage them imaginatively in the story I'm telling. So they get the feeling that this is happening because they're there. Uh, we did two shows that, uh, in college that uh, really helped me with that. One was I got to adapt a show that was actually a parody of Disneyland called I Think We're All Bozos on This Bus. It was based on a record by a group called the Fire Sign Theater. And uh, so I got to do all sorts of Disney stuff and that. But then we also did a production of The Drunkard, the old melodrama. And the melodramas used to oh, close with oleo acts. These are variety acts. And uh, I went to the director and said, if we're going to have variety acts there, I'd like to do uh, an old-style medicine pitch. And uh, so I got permission from my uh, professor and uh, did a little research and put together a pitch for uh, Tiger Fat, made from the marrow and fat of healthy, vigorous, contented young tigers. Cures headache, earache, toe ache, toothache, neuralgia, cords, warts, bunions, calluses, scalds, skin infections, hangnails, rheumatism, arthritis, muscular aches and pains, hardened arteries, higher low blood. And I put together this thing, and I had that. I added that to my arsenal. Um, while I was at, at uh, LACC, I got a job at Universal Studios as a tour guide. Now, the Universal Studios tour today is a very different thing. Back in the 70s, when I was there, the tour was two and a half hours long. It was a tram tour, took you through the back lot through all the sound stages. And uh, you had to talk for two and a half hours, and you had to give that tour two and three times a day. This is another thing I'd done as a child. I'd been on this tour and I wanted to be the tour guide. I got to do the tour guide job at, at uh, Universal Studios. And then in 1977, I left college and Magic Mountain brought me back again because they'd opened up a crafts village, beautiful crafts village called Spillican Corners. And they wanted to have a uh, medicine pitchman on the streets. Well, I already had a medicine pitch. They gave me a script for the one they wrote. It was very close to the one I'd written. And so uh, for four years, I was at Magic Mountain working on the streets, doing my medicine pitch, uh, and uh, working with something that uh, I call benign neglect. That means that management left me the hell alone. And I could go out there and do things the way I wanted to do them. You don't get to do that at Disneyland. But uh, I got to be my own man. I got to be, the character was a crook. I got to play a crook. I got to be uh, mildly abusive to small children because uh, children seem to sense, it's like W.C. Fields had this relationship with, uh, with children. Um, children sense this antagonism that a crooked character would have for them, and they played along with it. I had a wonderful time out there and did that for four years. Now, I was sitting at uh, Magic Mountain for four years doing this show about 12 times a day. And I learned how to do balloon animals, which is something Wally Bogue also did. And all this time, I was honing my skills. One day in 1979, I was visiting Disneyland with um, my girlfriend. And we're standing off of Main Street. She's, uh, she's off of the restroom, and I'm waiting out in the heat, uh, waiting for her to come, up, come back. And suddenly, I, stand, I look up, and standing in front of me is Tigger, mm -hmm. the neon orange stripes and the little beady eyes. And uh, I go, okay, hi. He goes, I said, uh, sure is hot out here. And he goes, I said, well, hot in there too, huh? And he leans forward and he goes, you're that crazy professor, aren't you? I said, yeah, I guess I am. He says, I'm a big fan of yours. 
I said, well, Tigger, I'm a big fan of yours, too. He said, don't go anywhere. And he walks backstage. He comes back a minute later <clears throat> with Eeyore and Chip. And I'm surrounded by these eight-foot-tall stuffed animals. <clears throat> and Eeyore says to me, well, I've never seen your work, but I've heard a lot about you. So I realized that people were paying attention. People were noticing what I did. And this is uh, an important lesson that you have some place you want to go, the place to start is the place where you are. Stay where you are, do the best job you can, and it resonates. <clears throat> In Christmas of 1979, an ad went up in Variety Magazine, again, Variety Magazine, that they were looking for a new cast for the Golden Horseshoe Review at Disneyland. The 25th anniversary of Disneyland was going to come up, and they wanted to double up on the number of shows they did at the parks. And so they were looking for a nighttime cast. And I went into the audition with my medicine bag and my cane, just like I was going to do a show at Magic Mountain. And as I walked up to the front of the stage to the audition, the head of casting turned to Wally Bogue, who was sitting there, and said, this is the kid I told you about. And that's what those four years had bought me. So I got to do the medicine pitch for Wally Bogue. He fell off his chair laughing. And uh, in April of 19... 80, I got hired on to be that loud, brightly lit thing going on on the stage of the Golden Horseshoe. Now, the f amazing thing about this is, the same day that Disneyland called me to give me the job, I got a call from Universal Studios. <clears throat> the president of Universal Attractions had seen me do doing my medicine pitch at Magic Mountain. They were creating a new theme restaurant up at the Universal Tour, a $3 million theme show called Womp Hopper's Wagon Works. It was going to be a Western, country Western themed dinner uh, establishment. <coughs> All themed to a wagon, this old wagon salesman, this crooked wagon, wagon salesman. They had wagons hanging from the ceiling. Beautiful big place. And they, uh, the president of Universal Studios took one look at me and said, This guy is C.L. Womp Hopper. So I got the job offer from Disneyland the same day I did from Universal. But the Disneyland one was going to be full-time in the summer. The Universal one wasn't going to start till the fall. So I could take them both. I worked full-time at the summer of 1980 at Disneyland. And then in the fall, I went over to work at Universal Studios as creative manager of uh, Womp Popper's Wagon Works. I hired all the wait, wait staff, wrote comedy material for them. And suddenly I was in business. I was, uh, I was working both ends towards the middle. <clears throat> I was on, still on call at Disneyland. And so for about a year and a half, I was bouncing back and forth between uh, the two companies. In uh, 1982, um, I was going to talk a little bit about Walt Disney. Um, the, uh, I read a lot of books. I, read, I think I read just about every biography about Walt Disney. And um, my, there's, there's a lot of uh, opinions out there. A lot of the books aren't too, aren't too uh, nice. A lot of them are just, one of the couple of them are just pure plain evil and, and uh, don't know what they're talking about. But the thing about him that struck me and inspired me was that he saw the potential in everything. He, ever since he was a child, everything that he touched, he would look at and try to figure out how to make it better. He did this with animation. Animation was very, very primitive art form when he started, when he came in. And uh, he wanted to give his characters more heft, make them move more like real creatures. He had he trained his artists, developed an art school for his artists so they could figure out how the human how human anatom anatomy worked. When they did Bambi, they brought in animals and uh, studied the way they moved, had him around the studio. Um, and uh, he was always trying to upgrade the art form, whatever it was he touched. He brought color to uh, animation. He brought sound to animation. He um, created the first anim uh, animated feature film which people told him was nuts. Nobody would want to sit still for animation that long. Um, he, he made night, nature films that won all sorts of awards. You know, Walt Disney won more Academy Awards than any other person that ever lived, uh, about 31 in his lifetime. Um, and uh, he did this with uh, he did oh, he did this with amusement parks. He took a look at amusement parks, which were always dirty and run down and crooked, and he tried to figure out a new way to, to revolutionize that. Um, Walt Disney did not as such, invent theme parks. I contend, and this is my theory, theme parks have always existed uh, wherever somebody wanted to t 
to create an atmosphere with a unifying theme. So if you study the history of uh, Coney Island, there were three uh, amusement parks that went up at Coney Island in rapid succession. And um, each one was an improvement over the one before. And you can see the genesis of the themed environment. Knott's Berry Farm actually uh, was a, a themed area before Disneyland was, before it opened up down the block. So um, where was I? Um, so I got into uh, I got in the Golden Horseshoe. Wally in 1962 decides he's going to re retire, and I have the idea that um, I'd like to uh, take the job over. I love doing the Horseshoe. I figured I'd be good for 15 years doing that, but uh, I didn't get the job. So another fella uh, came in who was actually more suited to the Disney style than I was. I was still a little bit of a carryover of uh, Professor Spilliken. And um, I, at this time, one of the things that I tell people, that if you want to get a job in at uh, one of these dream jobs, do you want to be an Imagineer? Do you want to be the dream finder? Uh, the way to do it is to get into the company and look around. Just get, take a job, any job at all. And uh, because when you work for Disney, they let you uh, peek behind the curtain. They let you see how the magic is done. And you get to talk to the magicians. There was a presentation at Disney University where they treat the, tra uh, train the employees by a fellow named Tony Baxter. Tony Baxter was the, uh, the man behind the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and um, uh, Disneyland Paris, brilliant uh, <coughs> designer. And uh, he spoke to a bunch of us Disney employees about careers at WED Enterprises, which is what Imagineering was called back then. And he did a whole talk, long talk, about the project he was working on at that time, which was Epcot Center, and he was working on the journey into imagination which was going to be a, a whole ride about the process of creativity. It was going to be a part of Future World. And he talked all about the ride. He showed us all sorts of graphics about this. You know, nowadays, the Imagineers can't talk about what it is they're working on because of the Internet. And everything they talk about goes out the Internet. People steal their ideas. People claim, I came up with the idea first. And we've created this whole uh, atmosphere, uh, competitive atmosphere uh, with the fans so they don't talk about things as much as they used to when Walt was around. But he told us all about imagination, and he held up a picture of Dreamfinder and Figment. And they, uh, he said, these two are going to be the only Disney characters at Epcot. There's not going to be any Mickey Mouse, no Goofy. It's just going to be Dreamfinder. And he's going to embody all the process of creativity. And I have the same reaction I did the first time I saw Wally Bogue perform. I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be the dream finder. So I went to my boss and I said, uh, listen, you're going to have this dream finder character walking around. I'd like to, I'd like to do the, do the part. And uh, I went to a friend of mine ran uh, the uh, sound department at Imagineering. And I said, listen, can you give me a recording of the dream finder voice from the ride? Because I'd like to be able to duplicate it. So uh, he made me a little cassette. I go in to pick it up. And um, the, he says, by the way, this is Tony Baxter. And he introduces me to Tony and Barry Braverman, who had worked on the pavilion too. And they took me back and they showed me the opening scene from the ride. It had just been, uh, been uh, programmed. I got to see the whole thing run. And they sat me down. They talked to me at length about the characters. And I took my little cassette home of the Dreamfinder voice. And I studied the voice, trying to duplicate it. And I left a phone mes uh, message on my phone machine saying, Ron's off on a flight of fancy and won't be back for some time. So leave a message after you hear the tone. And I came home and 10 people had called and hung up without leaving messages. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if that was Tony Baxter? And that's who it was. The next day, I was back at Wed Enterprises and I got to record the Dreamfinder voice for parts of the ride. The fellow who had originally done it hadn't finished it, so I got to go in and match him, and I got to become the voice in the ride. So in 1982, I left Southern California once and for all and uh, moved here to Orlando and opened uh, opened a Journey into Imagination. Now, I've been very fortunate in a lot of the jobs I've had, as you've heard, because I've been doing things that nobody else has been doing. When I was Professor Spillick and I was the first person to do Professor Spillikin. I was the first person to do the King Henry VIII role uh, in San Diego. Um, I was the first person to do the traveling uh, salesman and, and all these different different characters. And when you're the person originating it, 
There's no book for you to follow. There's no standard. There's nobody to train you. I had to teach myself how to be the dream finder. Now, uh, if you've seen any uh, artwork of dream finder and figment, dream finder's carrying figment uh, in his arm. My real arm was inside the dragon, animating him. And uh, there's a fake arm that was holding the dragon. And I walked around like this, creating these two characters. I had to figure out a way to bring the two of them to life. I wanted, I wanted the guests, when they came walking up, before they ever talked to us, before they met us, I wanted them to see two living beings, two independent thought uh, processes. And so I had to learn how to animate Figment in such a way that he would look like he was alive and not just his head flopping around. So I worked on that. I worked on um, aiming him, making it look like he was looking right into the camera. If you see pictures of Dreamfinder and Figment walking around the park, and if you go online, type in Dreamfinder and Google Images, you'll see lots of pictures of Dreamfinder and Figment. You can always tell the ones that are me, because Figment looks like he's looking right into the camera. But the, uh, the thing about Epcot, the people who created that park were very brave because they decided to say, we're going to build a second theme park at Walt Disney World with no Mickey Mouse. And the people who were running the company, Card Walker and Ron Miller and Don Tatum, uh, the Imagineers came to them and said, we want to build a second park. It's going to cost $1.2 billion, and there's not going to be any Mickey Mouse. They said, okay. So the park was not about fantasy. It was about the real world and your place in it. We had all these pavilions we had the transportation pavilion, the energy pavilion, uh, the communications and future lifestyles, and they were all about inspiring people. And I've met over the years dozens of people whose lives were affected by what they saw at Epcot Center, including the journey into imagination. We had a message there that creativity, imagination is something that belongs to all of us. And in playing Dreamfinder and Figment, I wanted to put that message across. I wanted to find a way that I could get the guests to interact with me playfully in a way that they, their own imaginations would be engaged. But guests don't work like that. See? The guests, uh, their only priority was, well, that guy's kid had his picture taken with the monkey. I want my kid's picture taken with the monkey. And they just want to shut the kids up, get a picture taken with us, and then drag them away. But I had to find a way to trick them into playing with me. And one of the things I struck on was in the ride, Dreamfinder is collecting sparks of inspiration. The, the, uh, in order to create the ride, Tony had to quantify the creative process. So he broke it down into three steps, collecting, storing, and recombining. You collect sparks of inspiration, the things that go on around us. You store them in your mind, and then you recombine them into new things because there's nothing new under the sun. And uh, that's what... Uh, that's what the ride was about. You saw Dreamfinder collecting sparks and then creating new things out of them. So what I stumbled upon uh, in my day, daily work with Dreamfinder was I would treat the guests as if they were sparks of inspiration. Every child I saw was like I'd never seen a child before. And Figment would be absolutely amazed by everything he saw. And so we would trick the guests into playing with us that way. Uh, if an adult came walking up, of course, adults are more, you know, they're more skeptical. You're meeting a wizard with a dragon. There's only a few ways people can react. But uh, the parents would be kind of on their heels, you know, looking at us very skeptically. So I would just ignore Figment. I'd talk to the parent like that. Figment would be looking at him, looking at me, looking at him. Finally, the parent would say, what's that? And i say, oh, do you see him too? And this way, we tricked them into playing with us. I found this whole thing very, uh, very rewarding. The two things I miss about playing Dreamfinder... One is having Figment by my side. The other was the look on the children's faces. Uh, one of my favorite stories that I tell too many times. So I was walking off set one time, and there was this uh, little African-American child looking up at me, maybe about five years old. I kneeled down, and I introduced him to the dragon. And we talked for a while, and he's just absolutely dumbstruck. Finally, I was getting up, and I said, well, I got to go now. Goodbye. And he looks up at him and he says, goodbye, Jesus. <laughs> his tears pouring down his face. And I couldn't move. I just stood there for a minute. Goodbye, bye. Everybody around laughing hysterically. I can just hear the kid when he goes home. Yeah, I met him. He had two heads and he called me by my name. <laughs> and uh, 
this is, I got to meet all sorts of amazing people. I met, met Michael Jackson, uh, and I met um, uh, President Nixon, and I read, met Red Skelton, and all these famous people that you never heard of. Um, a lot of my idols I got to meet. And uh, I did that for five years. Now, I never lasted more than three to six years in any of these jobs because I wanted to learn as much as I could about this process, about this process of guest interaction. With all the jobs I'd already done, everyone was its own kind of thing, had its own formula, which I got to explore and play with at my own speed. And, um, uh, and I, I was adding this whole stuff to, to my, my, school, my little, my little uh, knowledge base. And so after a while, things would start to tire, uh, primarily because things were not getting any better or because management would change. Now, when I worked at Disneyland at the Golden Horseshoe, I was working with the people who had worked with Walt Disney. And that was a remarkable atmosphere to be in. Very, very supportive, very friendly. But while I was at, uh, at uh, Epcot, uh, Eisner came in. We had a big meeting. They brought us in one day, sat us down, and said, uh, the, we have a new structure for the parks. Uh, now all the different divisions of the park are going to be run as profit centers. And I took out a piece of paper and I wrote, Epcot, E-P-C-O-T, Eisner's Profit Center of Tomorrow. And I passed it around under the table so everybody got a chuckle. And uh, Disney became a very different place to work instead of everybody supporting each other now everybody was charging each other for the things that we used to do for gratis for each other all the different divisions and it was not nearly as much fun and uh, another change that happened was everybody at Epcot when they opened Epcot Center in 82 they hired more performing talent from all over the world than anything anybody's ever put together I think we had foreign groups from for all the world showcase things we had bands and we had the theatrical troops all these different things going on and what happens at Disney and all theme parks nobody works at a theme park because they want to push people through a turnstile everybody wants to be Walt Disney everybody wants to be the guy who comes up with the crazy ideas that anyone else makes happen and everybody all the performers at Epcot Center decided that they were writers and they started submitting ideas and treatments. And everybody was competing for these creative positions that they imagined were there. Uh, I had a couple of brushes with this myself. I wrote um, a little story treatment for Dream Fighter, took it to this one guy who was head of the video production facility at Epcot. He took my idea, put together a whole committee full of people. And he brought in an animator and a puppeteer and a professional writer. And they all, we all sat around at a table, and they absolutely destroyed my idea. But they spent $100,000 on the presentation. They built a miniature of the model. They had uh, uh, storyboards and sketchbooks. And we brought Michael Eisner in. They did a whole presentation to Michael Eisner, and he took one look at this thing, and he said, no, it's too big. It's, it's too, too overblown. So I learned, keep, the, uh, keep your ideas to yourself. But then I ran into somebody else, another guy's supervisor who uh, wanted to be known as a writer. And he did, uh, was doing a proposal to Disney to do a uh, convention show that would be based around a traveling salesman character. And somebody told him about me, and he asked me if I would help. So I came in, took a look at what he did, threw most of it out, rewrote the whole show for him. He took that script and submitted it all over the park with his name on it. I got credit for additional dialogue, and I learned Keep your ideas to yourself. And I had a friend I worked with who wanted to do a new character for a world showcase. He asked me to help him with it. So I created the character, wrote a couple scripts for it. He turned it around with his name on it, left my name on So I finally learned to keep my mouth shut. But the medicine show I'd written for that supervisor fell into the hands of a friend of mine who was working for another company outside of Disney. And I wound up uh, writing, directing, and starring in a theme dinner show in Kissimmee called Fort Liberty. And that's when I left, uh, left off dream finding. I was there from 82 to 87. 
And uh, that was five years enough. It was enough. Now I was uh, creating my own stuff. I did a lot of freelance stuff for a bunch of years. I wrote for, God help me, Chuck E. Cheese for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. And um, all well, this time I was doing theater, local theater, in, uh, in Orlando and around town. Uh, Universal Studios Florida was opening up. And um, they were going to have these celebrity lookalikes. They're going to have the Blues Brothers, Laurel and Hardy, and W.C. Fields, and the Marx Brothers, and Marilyn Monroe. And the people who were running it knew that I knew these characters. I had studied them when I was in high school. So they brought me in. I got to uh, write and direct and hire and train all of the celebrity lookalikes for Universal Studios. This turned into a writing position for the attraction. I got to do, I wrote all the shows for the first Halloween Horror Nights. Uh, event, and I was there for three years. I learned a hell of a lot, but then management changed because uh, Universal was determined to keep the unions out of the out of the parks. They didn't want the actors to become uh, members of the union. And I came in, and um, uh, I was there for three years, another three years, and I left. Um, went back to freelancing, did a lot of voiceover work. I got into doing voiceover work when I was at Disney, and. Uh, did uh, more consulting work for them. We created uh, Mickey's Birthday Land opened up. I created the train experience for that. And uh, in 1998, uh, I went up to Canada to the Banff Springs Resort, the castle in the Rockies. And I hosted um, a themed dinner show up there that we created uh, uh, for the Canadian Pacific Railroad. So I was there for two summers. Then I uh, came back and got in with um, Titanic, the exhibition. It was a museum tour. Uh, had a lot of artifacts from Titanic. Everyone that uh, worked there would portray somebody who was actually on the ship. I was uh, Ennis Hastings Watson, one of the fellows who built the ship and went out on the, on the cruise. And um, I learned more there. I was there for six years. I learned more there about storytelling and crowd control and writing than anything else I'd ever done. And uh, had an absolute ball. It's a terrific uh, story. Anybody who uh, starts working on Titanic suddenly becomes, uh, becomes a hobby. And I think I've had more hobbies than just about anybody because each of the themes that I've adopted, when I worked at Fort, Li Fort Liberty, I was studying the United States Cavalry. That became a hobby of mine because that was the setting for that. Dragons became a fascination of mine when I was doing Dreamfinder. Uh, the t traveling salesman became a big thing for me for many, many years. Uh, and Disneyland was still my hobby. I'm still reading about everything I can find about uh, Disneyland. Um, I did uh, six years at Titanic. And then they opened uh, the Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor. Any of you been to the Monsters Incorporated Laugh Floor? Yeah. No. Um, this is a, a stage show in Tomorrowland one of the old um, Circle Vision theaters. They have a great big screen, and on this screen are computer-generated monsters. Like if you saw Monsters Incorporated, these, some of the monsters from there were used in the show. And these computer-generated monsters do bad stand-up. Because now, if you saw the movie, you know they're collecting laughter instead of screams to power Monstropolis. So on this giant screen, you've got CGI monsters that are being animated in real time and can interact with the audience. The performers are backstage in soundproof booths, animating the characters in real time. Um, if you've ever seen uh, the cartoon president on Stephen Colbert, that's the same process. They're, they're reacting in real time to what's going on. I can see and hear the audience. I can, we had microphones in the audience. I could talk to them. And we would do a stand-up with, uh, with the audience in the show. It's a wonderful show. And uh, because I could do different voices, I got a job in there as one of the uh, monsters for the, uh, for the opening. Um, so I was there for about uh, two and a half years. And um, since then, I've been pretty much freelancing, doing uh, uh, writing contracts, consulting work, mentoring other performers, and uh, doing voiceover work. Uh, I read early on um, a quote from uh, a, a book called Illusions by Richard Bach. It said, we are never given a dream without being given the power to make it come true. 
And when I read that, uh, I wept because I, I knew immediately it was true that whatever I could imagine that I wanted to do with my life, it was possible. It was, there was a possibility of it. I had this dream of performing at the Golden Horseshoe Review, uh, and I got to do that, and I got to do so much more. Uh, I got to pursue my hobby of live performance, and we're now seeing that revolution. You know, you go to Renaissance fairs, Renaissance fairs, that's where the, the new ground is being broken in audience interaction because they don't have the corporate mindset about them. You know, the performers are out there on their own interacting with the guests and you can get away with murder. But there's a lot to be done, even in the corporate mindset and, and with the new attractions that are being built, the new technologies that are coming along, what Disney's gonna be doing with Star Wars in the parks. Um, we're seeing that revolution that I anticipated back when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very, very exciting time uh, to be a part of this, uh, or a part of this. Um, I did finally write my book. Uh, when the 25th anniversary of Epcot Center rolled around, um, I was part of the festivities unofficially, and um, I did a presentation to the Nas National Fantasy Fan Club, somewhat like I'm doing here. There was a guy in the audience named Jim Hill, of Jim Hill Media. He's kind of the uh, senior member of the online Disney fraternity. And uh, he took me aside after I did my presentation and said, that's a book. You need to write a book about this. So I wrote a book called From Dreamer to Dreamfinder. I think uh, Cody's told you about it. And 80% uh, of it is the memoir that I so brilliantly glossed over here. But the last 20% of it is a textbook about how to write and perform and all the things that I learned in my 40 years working at the theme parks. Uh, and there's one other uh, little fill up to the story. Um, a while ago, I saw a trailer for a movie called The Further Adventures of Walt's Frozen Head. So this, this is a fan-based movie, um, which told the story about this guy who finds Walt's frozen head down in the basement of the Magic Kingdom, and uh, Walt convinces him to take him upstairs to look around the park. I saw the trailer. They didn't show Walt's head in the trailer. Uh, because they hadn't shot it yet. I got a call uh, a couple months later, and I got to be uh, Walt's frozen head for the movie. Uh, we shot it about two years ago. It's going to be coming out later this year, and it's a real movie. Um, it's going to hopefully uh, debut at one of the film festivals. And uh, the film is kind, it's kind of a student film, but uh, my part of it, which I got to rewrite, uh, came out really nicely, and I, I was very pleased with it. Without the beard, I was surprised how much I looked like Walt Disney. Uh, if you'll go online, you can find the trailer for it, and you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. Um, that, I think, covers, uh, touches, light, touches lightly on uh, the different things I wanted to talk about today. We got, uh, looks like, plenty of time for questions, uh, or anything, uh, any other aspects of it I haven't touched that you'd like me to touch on. You want to have? Go. Cool. Questions? <clears throat> yeah. I just have a very quick one. Could you um, say one I more time? I cannot hear a thing. Let me no. put my headphones in. Maybe that will help. And you're going to re really have to speak up. Yeah, you want to go. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, they're moving over the microphone. This is exciting. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, can you say uh, one more time about uh, your experience on opening day? Um, like I say, we didn't. I didn't. Uh, don't have many memories of it. The only memory I have is that that one lunch at the Golden Horseshoe, which I did not realize I'd be working at twenty five years later. The only other memory is that I fell asleep in the car on the way home, which when I was a child, I always used to fall asleep in the car on the way home from Disneyland because I'd be absolutely exhausted. Uh, have you seen online the video of the opening day of Disneyland? Yeah. Yes, I'm sure you have. Um, that, that gives you an idea what that, uh, that particular day, Disneyland had printed up something like uh, 3,500 tickets. Uh, for employees of Disneyland, uh, of Disney Studios, the VIPs, they had the stars there, they had all the press there. They had more television cameras 
there for that one day to cover the opening live than had ever been gathered for any other production in the history of television at that time. Somebody counterfeited 5,500 tickets. There was a guy with a ladder uh, on a fence, leaning a ladder against the fence, charging people five bucks a pop to climb up the ladder and hop the fence for the Disneyland opening. So the disaster that you saw in that video was very real. The next day, Disneyland opened to the public. That was the day that I was there. George Lucas was there, too, as a child. Um, and uh, things were a little bit more settled there. You've heard the story about women's he uh, heels sinking into the wet cement yeah. on Main Street. Well, it, they just barely got that thing together uh, at the last minute, and things are breaking down right and left. Um, that's all true. Uh, there's a quote from Walt Disney where Walt uh, supposedly said, Disneyland will never be completed as long as there is imagination left in the world. That's not what he said. Uh, and it wasn't on opening day either. Uh, after the disastrous opening, there was so much bad press about what a disaster Disneyland was that um, Walt started scheduling personally guided tours. He would bring the press out. He would bring teams of the press out. He would show them around the park and explain how things are going to be fixed and what his vision for the future of the park was. They were in Frontierland with one of these press groups. And uh, he was standing in front of the stables where they had the miniature horses. And one of the reporters leaned back against a hitching post which had been freshly varnished. And he just stood up and there was varnish all over the back of the suit. And he said, Walt, when is this place going to be finished? And Walt said, it's never going to be finished. Mm -hmm. Well, this guy named Marty Sklar is the fellow who wrote all of Walt's quotes. <coughs> and he wrote, Walt Disney says, Disneyland will never be completed as long as there is imagination left in the world. And that's where we get that quote. Um, when Disneyland opened, uh, there was a plumber striker went on just before opening, and um, the, uh, they did not have time to install both drinking fountains and restrooms. So Walt Disney said, well, we can't, they can't be in the streets. So they, uh, they built the restrooms, left off the drinking fountains. Disney had people walking around with big plastic canisters on their back with a tube, and they were going around and handing out cups and filling the cups with water. And the press accused Disney of not, of not putting out drinking fountains so that the guests would have to buy soft drinks. Uh, another thing about opening day, the first day that it was open to the public, um, the, uh, the, the uh, Interstate 5, which runs right by Disneyland, um, was not completed. And uh, there was a huge line of cars outside of uh, waiting into the parking lot. Roy Disney, Walt's brother, came driving up, and a guy came running out and says, Mr. Disney, Mr. Disney, uh, the people are winding up in, to get in, and uh, they're, they're in, out in the parking lot, and they're peeing in the parking lot. And uh, Roy was uh, so glad to see crowds, so relieved that people were going to show up. He said, God bless them, let them pee. <laughs> um, there are, are all sorts of stories about the opening. Um, I will recommend to you, take these names down, I will take, recommend to you three authors. If you're interested in knowing about the history of Disneyland, these are the people who you got to read. One is Sam Genaway, G-E-N-N-A-W-A-Y. Uh, he wrote a book called The Disneyland Story. Um, and uh, that's a wonderful book. That just came out not too long ago. Sam Genaway. Uh, another name is... Um, Jim Corkis, K-O-R-K-I-S. Uh, he is the walking encyclopedia of all things Disney. And um, he writes, writes all sorts of books, obscure books about the histories of Disney in films and the parks. And I recommend him. And the third person I'll recommend is my pal Jim Hill. Um, he's got a blog, uh, sorry, a podcast called um, The Disney Dish. And Jim Hill is in the middle of presenting a uh, chronological history of Disneyland, which is uh, wonderful. And Jim knows more about Disneyland and the parks than anybody is, except maybe Jim Corcus and uh, Sam Genoway. Uh, but if you're interested in studying the early days of Disneyland, uh, that's what I'll send you. There are a lot of books out there. Uh, if you're going to look up books on Disneyland history, go to Amazon. Be sure to read the reviews. 
uh, just like myself, everybody in the world has written a book about Disneyland. Some of them are good, some of them are not. But Corcus, Genoway, and Hill are names you can trust. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of material out there on uh, YouTube about the early days of Disneyland. Anything you hear about Walt Disney, take with a grain of salt. Um, he was not an anti-Semite. He was not a racist. Um, he was a Midwestern businessman, basically, who just, whatever he saw, he wanted to improve. And when you work with for somebody like that, somebody who is constantly looking towards the potential of any particular project, that inspires people. And he inspired the wonderful artists he brought in. The people that he had working for him were much more talented than he was, but they didn't have the vision. So he inspired them, and that's why uh, that's why we're all Disney fans. You know, it's it's interesting. Uh, you look at anything that Disney produces now, anything that comes out of the company now, fifty percent of it is wonderful, amazing, and fifty percent of it isn't that great. And we've all had that experience of going to see things that Disney did and going, what were they thinking? I contend that the reason we're Disney fans to this day, the reason we're loyal to the company has nothing to do with the company. It's because of Walt Disney and the image of that man who used to host the Sunday night shows and used to show us around backstage and how the magic was done. The things that he accomplished up till December 15th, 1966 is the reason we're loyal to him today and loyal to the company. If you go see a Disney film nowadays, you'll notice they've taken the name Walt off the front of the film. It no longer says Walt Disney. It just says Disney. I think that was a big mistake. Any other question? I think I think that about does it for time. So thank you very yeah. much, Ron. <laughs> thank you. And so we will meet next week. Like I said, next week we'll talk about um, the possible field trip. Um, what will happen if you want to do that uh, for those of you who weren't here originally uh, or when we talked about it if we're going to talk about possibly going to try to see one of the new releases um, and so decide if you want to do that um, and then if so there is uh, Black Panther came out this last weekend and then also later I believe at the end of March um, a wrinkle in time comes out. So those would be the two that we would decide this week. So we'll we'll talk about that next week. All right? Everyone have a good week. Thank you, Ron.